Hi, everyone. Pleased to have with us today Mike Abrashoff, former Navy captain and author of the best selling book, It's Your Ship. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Tony. How have you been? I'm doing well. I mean, I'd rather be out on the road. I'd rather be out there helping companies get better, but I'm using this time productively to think about the future and, and how we need to retool to, to meet our clients' needs. So this has been a good time to, to think about that. All of us are doing the same thing. Uh, for those who don't know Mike's story, just a quick thumbnail. Um, he took command of the near worst performing ship in the Pacific Fleet when he was 36 years old. And within 12 months, it became the best performing ship in the entire Navy using the same crew, which is always the, the, uh, the wild card. Um, and it was a great example of the importance of culture and leadership and how those two things are just vital to create a transformation in an organization. Um, Mike, the, the book, It's Your Ship, talks about that story. You go into great detail about the transformation and you talk about it being something that the crew did. Uh, but the first thing, the first place you started was to look in the mirror and say, how do I need to change the way I lead differently? What is it about the book that is so compelling that's caused it to sell 1.1 million copies? It's extraordinary. It's, it's a, quite an honor, and I'm very humbled that it has done so well. But at the end of the day, you know, I was in the middle ranks. I, I, it's a 320,000 person organization. I ran a crew of 310. So in effect, I was a mid-level manager. And many people think, oh, I can't make a difference because I'm just a mid-level manager. I think what resonates with people is, yeah, I was just a mid-level manager. I couldn't choose our missions. I couldn't choose our budget. I couldn't choose the people I work with, yet you find a way to make it work. Right. And that's what people are facing today. You know, Lord knows there's a lot of pain and agony out there today. Loved ones losing their job, everybody suffering loss of income, people losing their lives. And it's, it's tough, but it's up to us to chart a course to see us through and to keep us in control of our own destiny. And that's what I tried to get across to my crew every day was, we own this, we right. need to control our own destiny. And it's not about me, it's about all 310 of us working together as a team. Yeah, and I've always thought, you know, we've worked together a long time, and I've always thought that the real compelling attraction to the story has been so many people can relate to the idea of not being able to control the conditions or the tools that they have to accomplish the job, yet they're charged with a, achieving a particular outcome. So you're told to do this, but you're not, not necessarily given all the tools you might like to have to accomplish it. And we are in uncharted waters right now. I mean, who would have ever thought uh, that we have to do this in a virtual world? Right. Uh, we don't get to see our coworkers every day. And so um, it's not impossible, but it we have to think differently. And we have to be intellectually curious, try some things, uh, improve on it. For example, uh, my sister is now working in a virtual world. She works in a group of 250 people. And the head of the group thought it might be neat to have a happy hour at 1.30 on a Friday afternoon. And he made his favorite drink for everybody to watch. Well, for starters, he, his intentions were good. He wanted to create like a social setting but in those 250 people, I don't think it's a good idea to glorify alcohol because you never know people's past or, or people's family struggle with alcohol. So I would have never done that. And second, he did it with too many people. Right. And uh, he's a decent guy who wanted to do something better. And so my sister calls me and says, what should he have done? Tell me about your group. How many people are in your little group? She said 15, 16. What he should have done was go by small groups, 15 or 16, and have a get together and solicit ideas. What's working? What isn't working? What do we need to continue to improve on? What's on your mind that I can raise up the flagpole so that we can solve the issues that you're facing? Right. So um, A for determination, 
and wanting to do something that could connect with his team, but the execution wasn't great. He didn't think through how it was all going to play out, and it was a complete dud. So now he's doing 10 to 15 people at a time. So my point is, try something, right? learn from it, improve. And boy, that's exactly the territory we're in now because, you know, coming out of this, a lot of companies I've been reading about have said, we're more efficient, we're more effective, we're getting more done. Um, we like the idea of virtual and we also like the idea that we may not have to spend money on, uh, as much money on office space. Uh, so the idea of suddenly leaders being in a situation of uh, leading a group of people that they don't see all the time, they really are gonna be in a situation of try it, see if it works. You're gonna make mistakes, course correct, and, and just keep an open mind and keep moving forward. What are the most important qualities to try if you well, were a new virtual leader? So what I'm hearing today is people have Zoom meetings back to back to back all day long. And when I got to the ship, all we were doing was having meetings. Nothing was ever getting done. Right. So I carved out Wednesday. We called them no meeting Wednesdays. And uh, you could, that was my gift to you to get your work done and to get your priorities done. And there would be no meetings. Improve productivity. Uh, when people could say, this is the day I'm going to get this done. And we even expanded it to no meeting Mondays. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're, you know, we're all trying new things and we're on a new course. Maybe we need to be more efficient with the scheduling of the meetings right. so that we can give people the productive time, the thinking time, so that they can do the what-if scenarios. What do I need to do to prepare for six months down the road or this right. coming? So, um, but... Uh, having said that, the key, there is a lot of angst and um, fear right now. Where are we headed? That's when leaders need to step up even more. And right. communicate. Listen to what the, the fears are and then communicate a strategy to overcome those fears. And you may not have an answer, but at least be honest and say, I understand. I'm working on it. I will take your input if you have any ideas. And that's what they did on the ship was gave every sailor the, the, the right to have an input. I didn't always listen to their ideas, but they knew that they could raise issues and be intellectually curious and constantly strive to improve. And my challenge to them was just be 1% better today than we were yesterday. Right. You know, we're not going to swing for the fences. Right. If if we're just 1% better today than we were yesterday, nobody's going to touch us. And that's where we are today is everybody should be asking themselves, how can we make this virtual world work even 1% better today? And sometimes it's about improving the processes and um, having people get people a seat at the table so that they can take ownership. Got it. Well, I have a surprise in that Polly Labar. Uh, has joined us. Hi, Polly. Hi, Tony. Hello, old friend. Mike, how are you? Most people don't know this. I would be nothing without Polly Labar. <laughs> yeah. And uh, our ship was the show ship for the Pacific Fleet. And Polly was invited out to write a, an article that, that launched my career as a writer and also as a public speaker. And unknowingly, she got me in trouble in that first article, and I've never told her about this until today. <laughs> I've got this spinal condition that causes me to put my feet up on the desk during the workday. And when Polly was in my office, I had my feet up on the coffee table, and she put that in the darn article. <laughs> I, get a, I get an email from a four-star saying, Abershoff, get your feet off the furniture. <laughs> You know, uh, I had to add a little color in the lead, so, yeah, you know. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, that's great. Well, well, Mike, it's actually amazing that you say that because I, I, I on the occasion of, of coming in to see you here, I reread um, not just that first article, but some of the, the books and, and subsequent follow-ups that we did. And I have to say, you know, I think it's been 20 years and we haven't aged today, I know. Uh, <laughs> but really... 
you know, the themes that you set up around unleashing human potential and devolving responsibility and power and uh, paying so much more attention to performance and uh, individual initiative than to the rules and standard operating procedure, you know, all those themes. I mean, I certainly have been working on those for, for 20 years and, I, and I, it's too bad we haven't made more progress across the entire economy on this, but I think it's more relevant than ever before. So I have to thank you too for, for lighting my passion around on those things. So then let me tell you what was the biggest event of my life was the 2nd of August 1990 uh, back when Saddam invaded Kuwait and I just happened to be on a ship that was in the northern Persian Gulf 100 miles south of Kuwait and at 4 30 that morning we detected 21 unknown fighters coming directly at our ship and we sound the general quarters alarm and I get to my radar screen and I'm thinking my life insurance is paid up and my will is up to date. And I gave us a 50% chance of survival that day. And just as we were getting ready to fire the first missile at those fighters, they hung a right turn into Saudi Arabia. And we later found out it was the Kuwaiti Air Force fleeing Kuwait that morning. But after the excitement died down, I started thinking, I don't like a 50% chance of survival. I wonder what we could have or should have been doing differently while we had the chance to put ourselves in a position to control our own destiny. And that's what's at stake today is controlling our own destiny in an uncertain world. And all those stupid things that we used to engage in, like lack of collaboration, or not supporting a fellow team member, or office gossip, we need, we, we need to hit the reset button on our new work way and stop participating in things that we've always done that don't add a thing to our bottom line and our ability to drive performance. And when I took command of the ship, that's what I focused on every day. Forget about the things that don't add value and only focus on the things that, that will make us the leader in our industry. And to me, that's what's at stake today. And that's what we have the ability to, to do to reset right now, to drive us uh, in that direction. And I think the other thing that you did, like even one step further than that, not doing the stupid things and focusing on the value add is that you introduced, and you didn't call it this, but this is sort of what I've been working on. You introduced this notion of practice and organiz organizational uh, innovation and evolution into everything you did. You looked at every single practice and atomized it and said, you know, what's worth doing? What should we change? And how could we make this better? And this whole notion of evolving the vehicle that's going to get us to the future, it doesn't occur to people. They think we've got to make a better product or a better service, but they don't think about how is our approach to performance review hamstringing us on this road to the future? Right. Correct. And, and it wasn't uh, revolutionary. It was just improving a little bit every day mm -hmm. so that I didn't upset the uh, culture of the organization. Just, yeah. just improve a little bit. One of the things we were talking about before you got here, Polly, was really the idea that now so many companies are going to wind up being virtual. They're finding they're more efficient in a virtual um, situation. Um, and leaders are going to have to figure out, and I know you've, you've talked about this a lot, and you've done a lot, a lot of exploration and work on it, they're going to have to figure out how to work with people who aren't um, able to be seen. Sort of that far-flung workforce is going to be um, uh, part of more leaders' lives uh, in the future than it was in the past. So how do people lead differently? How is... It's a scary world... Trust? It's a scary world for control freaks. <laughs> it's yeah. my first comment going forward. Yeah. And, you know, I think, again, a lot of the themes that feel more urgent than ever now were already in play before this crisis that, right. that we're facing and this challenge that I think is going to continue to unfold. It's not like a moment in time. This is sort of a new reality. Um, the, the one thing I'll say here is that the most progressive, productive, engaging, uh, exciting organizations that I've spent time with over the last decade have already gotten hip to this idea that, you know, your job as a leader isn't to, you know, keep your eye on and control everyone in your orbit, you know, 
FaceTime every single day, it's to figure out how do we create platforms and systems um, and ways of working where the people who do the work, the people who are at the front lines or the people who are involved in, in whatever your work is, have the ability to collaborate horizontally, peer to peer. And the more that we can provide, provide platforms to do that across space and time, that's going to be more and more important. Um, and where they have the authority, the local decision making authority to take initiative, to change something, to tweak something, to make something better, and don't have to, you know, run it up the proverbial chain of command. And while you may not be seen, you have to give your people a voice. And if they can have that voice and give you their ideas and, and also what's keeping them up at night and to give them to you without um, any fear, but give them to you with confidence, that's how you create a vibrant, intellectually curious workforce in a virtual world. You did. You said something in one of the speeches that I saw, uh, Mike, that I, I hadn't heard the story before. And it was something about there was a suggestion box on the ship. Um, and in a very short period of time, people came to trust you and realized they were being listened to, to the point where soon there were no suggestions in the suggestion box. They were just coming to you directly saying, hey, Cap, how about this? That's correct. And that should be everybody's goal is to have get people to feel comfortable to surface those ideas right then and there, instead of agonize over whether, how this is gonna be perceived. And so um, each squadron of six ships also has a chaplain that rotates between ship and, and on a daily basis so that sailors who are having issues can go see the chaplain. After about six months, the chaplain would come to me and say, nobody's knocking on my door. You know what's happening. <laughs> so this this type of work environment can improve people's mental health as well, and that's the other thing that we need to think about in this virtual world, in this pandemic world, is the mental health of our people who may have had loved ones that are in a nursing home, that may have had loved ones who lost their job, and we have to be empathetic to that. And if we don't talk to people and find out what their journey is, we'll never know. Yeah. And just building on that, Mike, you know, something I observed in, in your orbit and, and I think is more important to that point of mental health and kind of humanizing our organizations so that people feel like they have that, that to fall back on is this notion of, I think I said over and over in that piece, and I hope you didn't get in trouble for it, the, the, even with the discipline that you is required in the Navy and on a ship, there was a sense of informality and connection and the ability to speak your mind and the ability to maybe do something that was a little bit, you know, out of the, the uh, hard line of, of how you might want to do something. And I think that ability to connect in, in a human and uh, you know, unstilted, uh, non-corporate or non-militaristic way um, is something that's been lacking in a lot of organizations. And, and it, it takes a little bit of a personal inner journey for leaders to allow that kind of, of, that kind of, of climate to, to be created. Absolutely, absolutely correct. And um, the, the more, when people feel connected to their work, discipline actually improves. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the military is a rules-based, discipline-oriented organization, but I've got the, the disciplinary statistics to prove a dramatic decrease in disciplinary cases when people feel engaged and when they feel empowered and when they feel connected. They will comply with what you want them to do because they want to do it, not because they have to do it. Yeah, you really, you probably transcended what is the toughest trade-off in the world of organizations, which is the trade-off between freedom and control, you know, discipline and creativity. Uh, and, and it's something that's a, a real tension, I think, for leaders, because we live in this world full of millennials and the Facebook generation and people who didn't grow up in rules-based hierarchical organizations, right? Their, their version of an organization is a social network, not what we grew up with. So you've got that right and then you also have a world of organizations where control is important in their high stakes organizations the military is one of them but many others require a lot of precision a lot of control a lot of performance so how do you get that 
as well as all that freedom to innovate, to be yourself, to feel like a human being? I found that the more control I gave up, the greater command I got over the organization. That's great. And it used to be that we had to be involved in everything. Well, we don't. Let's pick our top priorities. And me, for me, if, if what we were doing could kill somebody, injure somebody, waste taxpayer money or do damage to the ship, I'm going to be involved. But you know what? If it doesn't rise to that level, I'll be happy if you give me 85% because that means I don't have to get involved and it allows me to focus on higher value work that, that can get us uh, greater returns. And so when people feel connected, when they want to do a great job, and when they feel in control of their own destiny, uh, they can lift burdens off your shoulders as a leader. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question about empowerment, which is a word we probably overuse and abuse in the world, in the world of business? Because I think you got it so right. And you mentioned earlier this notion of what happens when everyone genuinely feels like they have a voice and they're going to be listened to and heard. But I think there's a second piece to this, which is it's not just about saying we empower you, you have a voice, here's a suggestion box. It's also we're going to do everything we can to equip you, to train you, to upskill you, to give you all the goods you need to be a decision maker, to be someone who's an innovator. And I think you got that right. So what have you learned about that? Or, or do you think that's an important uh, piece of the puzzle? So as you know, former Secretary of Defense William Perry was my huge mentor in, in my career. In my last day working for him, prior to taking command of the ship, he brought me into his office and sat me down and said, Mike, no matter how hard you try, your ship is never going to be perfect. He said, you're going to have disappointments every day. He said, whenever you're disappointed in an outcome, I want you to remember one thing. He said, assume your crew wanted to do a great job. And if you don't get the results you're looking for, don't blame them first, but instead look inward. Did you clearly communicate the goals? Did you give them the training necessary to be successful? Did you give them the time and the resources to do a great job? But most importantly, did the process support them delivering the results you were looking for? And you know what? 80% of the time when I was disappointed in an outcome, I was part of the problem. So you're right, it's about training people, uh, improving processes every day, uh, giving them the time and the resources, but most importantly, communicating. And in a virtual world, that communications piece is gonna become uh, even more critical, how we get everybody on board, get them to understand where we're going, why it's in the organization's best interest, but most importantly, why it's in their own best interest that they get on board. Yeah, fascinating. Um, Mike, the one word that comes to mind as I listen to you talk about all of that is trust. I mean, ultimately, people trust, come to trust you because they, you hear them, because you're listening, because they're feeling empowered, they're doing things, and they're getting the right feedback when, when they do it or when they make a mistake, you're correcting them in a way that is encouraging. That all builds trust, right? So the turning point on the ship came, I'm not going to talk about the situation, but a sailor came up for his interview the day afterwards. And he said, you know, Captain, it seems to us, the crew, that you don't care if you ever get promoted again. And I said, what on earth are you talking about? He said, what you did for us yesterday, you had nothing to gain. You did it for us. We want you to know we got your back. And that's what we need to get to in this virtual world is everybody having each other's back. And if we can do that, we're gonna be okay. Good point. Great way to end uh, talking about the future of leadership being virtual. Polly, thank you very much. It's your article that got me acquainted with Mike Abershoff way, way back then. Uh, and it's been a great relationship and it's so wonderful to work with both of you. Thanks for joining us, Polly. Mike, thank you for being here. And uh, we will do this again. It was a great conversation. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's such a pleasure to see you again. Take care, guys. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.